pretty much been kind of bred out of the design uh, modern design fly rod these days and and we still incorporate it in a lot of our product but lama glass was was really known for having a real strong stout top end and a thin profile butt section and we can we follow kind of the same similar concept but maybe not quite so strong in the top end of the rod but it's what they had going there is like i said a strong tip you load that thing with the fly line and the butt section is going to bend. And if you've got enough carbon fiber in that butt section, guess what's going to happen? That was Gary Berkheimer breaking down some of the benefits of a slower action rod. The soul of a custom fly rod today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thank you for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Uh, we've got a new way to ask a question. The Ask a Pro segment is a great way if you want to get one of your questions answered uh, on this podcast. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash askapro to submit your question uh, right now. Ask a Pro. That'll get you there. Uh, anything you have, would love to uh, get that question on the air uh, on the next episode. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that are second to none in quality and can be customized for that little extra touch. Please head over to wetflyswing.com stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com stonefly to get started right now. The Fly Fishing Film Tour is back. Don't miss this year's 2022 F3T as it returns to theaters near you for another season on the water. Full of rod bending action, unforgettable storytelling from coast to coast, swag, and more from local conservation partners. Please head over to wetflyswing.com F3T to find a show near you. That's wetflyswing.com F3T or Fly Film Tour. Dot com. Check it out right now. Kerry Berkheimer from Berkheimer Rods takes us into the story of how he built this great company focused around custom rod building. Kerry takes us back to some of the huge mentors he had along the way that helped him uh, develop his first rods. And we also hear about uh, how the spade rod came to be with his connection on the Deschutes River. And uh, we find out where this passion really comes from. It's pretty cool. Carrie uh, digs into a lot of that just on on where it all comes from. So, uh, so without further ado, here is Carrie Berkheimer from CFBflyrods.com. How's it going, Carrie? Hey, it's going good this morning. Thank you. Thanks for uh, thanks for taking a little time to to dig into some on uh, building fly rods. We. We've had a, a number of guests. I was just looking through our back catalog. We've talked about fly rods, but um, I know the rod and the story that you have of how you you know got to the point where you are is is a good one. So I'm going to dig into that um, and Berkheimer rods and everything you have going. But talk about first. Uh, let, let's talk about first how you got to the fly ship fishing, and then how, and then we'll take it to how you got from there into building fly rods. Oh sure, you know our families. We're pretty much from Idaho, or at least I am. I was born in Idaho, and my dad. I uh, was an avid hunter and a fisherman. And so he was uh, kind of a sales rep of sorts, and he would travel all through uh, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming when I was a small boy. And uh, as a consequence, we'd go camping quite a bit and do a lot of fishing along the way. And he knew a lot. So what he was doing. He was a circulation manager, plus he sold uh, carrier insurance for when the newspaper boys would deliver newspapers. He insured them. So he visited all the small towns through Idaho and Montana, et cetera, yeah, Wyoming, parts of Wyoming. And as a consequence, he met a lot of landowners who had a lot of private access to rivers. And so we got into the fishing aspect of it. He just, you know, that, that was what he really enjoyed was fishing small water uh, and private water. We didn't like a lot of people. Well, one of these uh, times uh, we were out fishing and uh, he he had a brown tackle box that he had, and it had a bunch of small flies. And I'm talking, I'm like four or five years old. And I'm looking at these flies, and I'm asking him questions about these flies. And 
turns out he had traded a uh, back in the day traded a 22 pistol to a friend of his that was they were in the forest service at the time on the rogue river blazing trail and he traded this pistol for these flies and they were all hand tied and really weird looking big old bushy brown ones and some muddler minnows <clears throat> excuse me probably for these you know the half pounders and steelhead and the rogue back in those and uh but i kept asking him questions and one time he took one out and we were not fly fishing at the time, Dave. We were actually spin fishing. And, but he took a fly out and just uh, put it on the end of his, basically his spinning rod line, and kind of dabbled it. And sure enough, a trout came up. So that really got the ball rolling, just watching that and being fascinated with it. Uh, one time I, we were on the Big Hole River. This is back in like 1960, 61, and uh, just outside of Melrose, and uh, so I grabbed this big old brown bushy fly, tied it on my spinning rod, no bubble, no nothing, just on the end of the four-pound test line, and dangled it over this bridge. I think the bridge is brown bridge, still there. And uh, I'm dabbling it. The wind's kind of blowing it up a little bit, and, and the fly would settle back down on the water, and I rolled a huge rainbow. And back then, they had 20-pound rainbow in that river. Oh, it was wow. unbelievable. Oh, yeah. And and I'm I'm... I'm just besides myself. I'm probably about eight years old at this time. <laughs> and I am just, holy moly, you should have seen this and that. Nobody would believe me. Well, it rolled again. Well, that got everybody's attention. <laughs> so <laughs> especially mine. Well, so we go home and I got this deep, you know, vision in my brain now. And uh, locally, a sporting goods store was going out of business. And they had a sale on fishing rods. And they had an old glass rod there. Nothing, nothing real pretty. But just an old glass rod, I think it was $3, and I bought it. And then for Christmas that year, I got an old Fluger medalist, you know, the old standby. Yep. And a supply line. And uh, was next year when we went through our pilgrimage through Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, uh, I had my fly rod. Well, we ended up uh, going to a place called the Muscle Shell River in pretty much central Montana. And the private ownership thing and... Uh, and I had these flies, and man, I'm ready to get going on this whole deal and tie on this fly. And my mom, my mom was uh, back at camp cooking food. My dad and sister and I were out uh, fishing, and they took my mom and excuse me, my sister and dad took off around the corner. Well, I'm here on this really neat stretch, and I'm watching this fish rise, and I tie on these this fly. I didn't know how to fly cast. Hmm. I, managed i probably lost three or four flies just to get one out there honestly uh you know rocks bushes etc behind me and i i make this uh, cast sort of kind of it lights out on the river on the water and sure enough a fish came up and ate the thing <laughs> and um i rose him once and then managed to get it back out there and, and the second time i actually hooked him and this fish just went berserk and i had never had so much fun landing a fish <laughs> in my body that time and that cemented the deal i at that time i was about honestly about nine or ten years old i can't remember the exact age but that was it after that point fly fishing was uh it was a done deal for me that's it that's it that's a cool story <laughs> yeah you know it, it dovetailed into more fishing trips obviously went through high school when i finally got my driver's license i started actually making the migration myself over to montana and idaho alone and it was all basically uh, all fishing at that point, camping and fishing way up into the wilderness areas. Uh, and then as a graduating senior, I, was, I remember laying in bed one early morning and I decided, well, shoot, this is it. What am I going to do with my life? And I was also uh, very deeply involved in music at the time. And so I'm thinking, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really make a push to try to be a musician. And somehow or other, I got to be in the fishing industry. And uh, uh, music didn't work out, fishing did. And that started the whole deal where I, I slowly kind of was introduced into a company where I had, uh, I, w I actually was part-time guiding at the time, uh, just to put food on the table. And that introduced me into a fly, or actually a fishing rod company up in Woodland, Washington, uh, where they asked me to come and interviewed me, and they offered me an opportunity to uh, be on their staff with regards to uh, fishing rods, and specifically fly fishing rods. So that's really what started the whole deal. Uh, and that's a nutshell, a nutshell scenario. There's a, you know, probably 
three hours of details there we don't want to know about. <laughs> but that's right. Yeah, you got a lot of you got a lot of stories of it too. I'm curious because the um, you know Woodland Washington. Maybe you could speak to this a little bit. I mean, it seems like I mean there's a lot of history there. Obviously, like Lamb of Glass, Loomis. I mean, there's a why Woodland Washington is why was that such a what do you see that as a hot spot and is it still kind of a place where a lot of people in the industry came through? I think so, and I think the reason was is because you had Lama Glass there that really came from Grizzly uh, back in the days, and Lama Glass was a major uh, player in the whole deal. Fenwick, of course, was uh, in the United States still at that time, so you had the Northwest really kind of had this hub of, of people and interest going on. Uh, of course, fiberglass was the main material at the time when Lama Glass came about, and Fenwick at that time too. But a lot of the guys that were working at Lama Glass, uh, for whatever reason, wanted to start their own company. Like a lot of uh, employees, they want to start their own wheel. Uh, they saw a better way, a better vision. And I think that's really what it was. Just a, what, what, In this industry, it's, it's really a, almost a cottage, really a, truly a cottage industry. Uh, you have a lot of handcrafted, uh, talented, handcraft orientated, talented people. Uh, that uh, wrap the rods, they, they do a lot of handwork on the rods. In that area up there, with Lama Glass being a pretty good player, a lot of player, had a lot of people working at home, uh, being able to uh, have that convenience. Maybe the kids take off for school, they, they wrap some rods and then drop them off or whatever. And so when the other companies spurred off from there, they, you already had an employee base uh, that was pretty convenient to have. But that's the only that's the only thing I can think of, really, Dave. As far as why why woodland, it just was you know, it's like if you had Boeing, then from Boeing came Cessna. Well, it didn't really, but you know, I mean, all these other little spur companies can start off from one. So that's it. And then you, and so your story of starting off is so you were you know I know you've worked with some of been around some of the great rod mines builders. I mean. Speak to that a little bit, who, you know, mentors wise, right? Like who are some of the people when you look back, kind of, you know, pinch yourself to be like, wow, I was around that person early on. Oh, sure. You know, I think the, the biggest one was, uh, I was doing some marketing research for the rod company that just hired me, uh, actually kind of on a part-time basis originally. And I was at West Yellowstone during one of the FFF conclaves. And uh, I had the opportunity to meet uh, Russ Peak who was d making rods uh, really as a career at the time, helping other companies fine tune their fly rods. And I think he's, he's still maybe not so much well known now on the table, but back in those days, he was the guru of the fly rod. And if you ever have a chance to really cast some of the stuff, you will understand why very smooth. Uh, at that time, uh, Russ was there in West Yellowstone. Well, he was, pulling out these rods and lefty cray was there and russ was handing lefty these rods and boy they're just raving a you know lefty of course <laughs> oh my god russ this is the best one yet you know what i mean but yeah well i went and introduced myself i thought shoot i'll probably never get this opportunity again well within 15 minutes i'm casting rods with the two best you know the best fly rod designer one of the best casters in the world oh wow and we hit it off uh i ended up uh, having a very personable uh, friendship and relationship with both of those guys. And it was just a marvelous door that had opened that I had no idea the, the magnitude of where it, would, where it would lead me. But very fortunate. And along with Lefty came a lot of people, uh, Flip Pallet and, you know, just a lot of guys that, uh, that today still that are around that have really contributed so much to the whole sport. And so I was really lucky in that uh, in, in being able to be influenced by those folks. Uh, Russ was very instrumental, not so much in teaching me to design fly rods, but how to read them. And, you know, how do you get rid of that tip wobble? Uh, why do you want to get rid of the tip wobble? You know, why is this one tracking a little different? Uh, how do you balance this butt power in this butt section and have it smoothly transition into the tip? Uh, he allowed me to do an incredible amount of experimenting i used him to critique a lot of stuff so i could bounce off of some of his knowledge while developing my own and it was really a really a wonderful opportunity to experience wow yeah that, that's amazing so 
So basically, you're around you know Russ and some of these other people, and, and at, at what point? So you know you, you're you're building rods, but at what point did you know? I mean, just take us to that point where you knew you know this was because I know you had a bunch of different things, right? You were building some woodwork and, and other things along the way. Uh, at what yeah. point were you all in on the fly rod, uh, custom rods, and all that? Or how'd you know? How, how'd you know when you were you were all in on it? Yeah, uh, you know, to digress slightly, the the music industry didn't work for me. Uh, I for whatever reason, every time I tried to open a door in music, it just slammed in my face shut. So as I got into the fishing industry, the doors were just opening. They were not closing. They just kept opening. And I kept walking through and I kept going up this ladder more and more and more. Well, after, I guess, a couple of years of working for the, the Woodland-based company that I was with, uh, I walked out. I brought a, a sample of a fly rod home. And I think it was a little seven or eight foot three way, three or four way. I can't remember now. And I went out. It was a beautiful afternoon. I got home. Sun's just going down, kind of a summertime setting in the front yard there. And I put this line through uh, the guides and reel on the, you know, everything was taped on. The guides were taped on. The handle was taped on. Nothing finished at all. And I started casting this rod. And the a most incredible experience happened. It was so surreal. I, it was almost like a meditative euphoria. I can't explain it. It sounds weird, but it's true. And I start. I just went. What it was like. I was watching this whole thing in slow motion, and a, this this peaceful, euphoric uh, sense of being came over me. And at that point, I honestly figured that I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know why, but this is this is uh, something's going on here. That's that's really unique and and i'm not going to ignore it and i so i just took that kind of planted that in you know in the nucleus of my being i guess and off we went but huh, <laughs> it, it's a weird go. deal and you know, i expect people to follow it but it's a it's a it's the truth it's just a strange deal and from that point on um i kind of went into that space when i was designing uh in a way to to give me kind of a compass on what to do so yeah uh, figure that right that's it. Yeah. No, that, yeah. that is amazing. I mean, for some people that don't have a, you know, maybe a connection. I mean, I know that's, I don't know what exactly that is, you know, but it's true because you hear people talk about it sometimes, right? That some other yeah. energy or whatever's going on that, and, and your rods. So, I mean, talk about that a little bit because your rods, you know, a lot of people talk about them as some of the best out there and there's so many rods now, right? There's all these rods and people talk about how, you know, you can't buy a bad rod. I'm, I'm curious to get your take on it. Like what, what is unique about, and I know, I mean, you're obviously walking us through this whole step when you're building these things, but but talk about that. What is the difference between, say, a rod like yours versus, say, you just go get a rod off the shelf? Um, what do you say when you get those questions? I'm sure you, you probably don't get those much these days because everybody knows you, but but is that a thing, or what do you think about that, or is there, or can you buy a bad rod? Well, I think you can buy a bad rod, but it's not very often anymore. Uh, back in the days when I started, there were a lot of bad rods, and people were still trying to figure out the equation. You had glass had come on strong, then you had carbon fiber come in, and and uh, the carbon fiber rods, a lot of them were just a disaster. They were uh -huh. trying to copy it with glass, and it didn't work. So there was a period of time when, you know, trying to find the and crack the code on carbon for graph or for fly rods was a, a real challenge. And that's about when I came into it. But our product, what we put into our product is, and my customers have actually named this or coined the name, the Berkey Feel. And uh, and I, it's true. I try to really hold within a, a not a narrow window, but certainly a defined, you know, defining the goalposts of where I want my actions to be, why they're the way they are. They're there for a specific reason. Uh, I want my rod to be an abs as broad a t usable tool as possible. So when I'm out on the river, and I used to guide, I did all sorts of things. So I, I have a, taught fly fishing schools, taught fly casting for years all over the country when I worked for the other rod. And so I have a lot of uh, base knowledge that went in, that goes into the designing of these things. And so when you're out on the river, you want to push a bigger fly maybe on your four weight well, you should be able to do it, even though it wasn't necessarily designed to push a bigger flyer. Or if you want to drop down to a midge pattern, because that's what's eating, and you don't have a whole quiver of rods to choose from, you want to be able to drop down to that that small fly, roll cast, single spay cast, overhead cast, 
uh, the rod needs to load in short. Incredibly important. Most most of the rods that I have seen, even to the day, uh, people are still putting 25, 30 feet of the line out to get the thing to load. Or now they're now the companies are going up a half a line size or two, you know, or, or or full line size to get the thing to load. So instead of your five weight, you're putting a six weight line on it, really, and it's kind of you know. So for me, all they're doing is trying to feel the rod, the customer is. And so we're trying to do that right out of the box. We're trying to say, hey, this is a five-weight rod. Put a five-weight line on it and really see what it'll do in close. And will it still punch out 70 feet, 80 feet? You bet it will. If you're a good caster, it will. So Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. Daddy Flies, established in 1928, is the oldest family-run fly shop in the world. And you know I'm all about the history and fly fishing, which is one reason I'm super stoked to have Deddy on as a sponsor this year. Long before I made my first order with Deddy, I remember hearing stories about the quality and the history and always wanting to connect deeper with them. So that time has come now, and I share the Deddy tradition with you. Located in Livingston Manor on the banks of Willow Weemock Creek, Deddy is your welcoming place on the creek or online. Their retail and online shop have a large selection of flies, materials, fly gear, outdoor lifestyle items, books, and more. Deddy Fly's inventory consists solely of products that meet every angler's demand for highest quality and service. Of course, they offer fly fishing and casting lessons as well as guided trips. For more information, visit Deddy Flies at wetflyswing.com slash Deddy or give them a call 845-439-1166. That's wetflyswing.com slash Deddy, D-E-T-T-E. You support this podcast by clicking over through that link to Deddy. Okay, let's get back to the show. Yeah, no, I love that. That's a great clarifying way to put it is that, um, yeah, you hear a lot about that. And and you, so when you talk about the big fly, small rice, so let's just take a rod, you know, a, a five weight, like you said, normal nine foot five weight. When you're designed, talk about that a little bit. Take us to the design. Like, how do you get that thing to produce a gentle touch and a, you know, if you had a big fly or a punch through the wind? I mean, you're saying your rods can do that versus maybe some other rods that maybe if they didn't do it right, wouldn't do that. How do you do it? Describe that process. And maybe just take us there. I know it's a <laughs> building a rod and, and that whole process is a yeah. lot, but take us there for a little bit. Well, I think that one of the things that I'm really after is I want the rod to do the bulk of the work. And there's so much talk about the light feel of a rod and all that. And our, and our rods are the lightest in the world. They really actually are. I, I weigh them. Uh, a lot. <laughs> I weigh every one of them. Actually. And I just want to see where we're at with, with carbon, you know, the material dis- distribution guides, handle, real seat, the whole bit. And what do we get? What are we ending up with? The thing that I'm doing a little different is I'm making the tips slightly stronger. Uh, and is what that does is it actuates the rest of the action. And by slightly sl- stronger, I'm talking, uh, and this is going to be hard to probably visualize, but on a pattern, on a on a flat sheet carbon fiber, a pattern might be three eighths or five sixteenths of an inch at the very tip, and it might go back to an inch and a half at the base of the tip. Four piece rod. Okay. Uh, well, I might add just a sixteenth more material. So if it's five sixteenths, it's going to be either three eighths or just a sixteenth above seven sixteenths. That tiny little bit of material uh, adds minimal amount probably hundreds of a gram of weight but it but it's what it does is it allows the rest of the rod to load if i kept the tip really light now i have to push the rod to make it to work so it's like i use the analogy oh. pitch I, I call it like pitching fastball all day mm-hmm. and uh, i don't know anybody that wants to go out and, and i want to go out and fish on the river and relax i don't want to be pitching fastball all day right. so the other thing does is you lose your accuracy the harder you push a rod the less accurate you're going to be and so i want the rod to, to give me the baseline of accuracy i want the rod to develop the line speed for me uh so i can deliver that fly on target uh you know so designing these things all that's taken into uh you know consideration as far as what the end goal is i want a really smooth easy casting rod that has power when i want it just like a car you know you 
you push the gas, you want the thing to go. If you want to back off, you can, and it's still going to give you a pleasant experience. Um, it, and one of the one of the other things that we incorporate too is a concept that I came up with a long time ago. I call it preload, and preload is where when you actually take the rod out, assemble it, and then you kind of give it the old band, the shake, the, you know. The, oh yeah. Yep, fly rod shake, shake in the <laughs> shop, right? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and if that tip is is just so light, you don't you can see that you're not getting the rest of the rod to move unless you really torque the thing to make it move. With a tiny bit more material at the top, that whole you know two thirds of the rod could be actually oscillating back and forth, and not just the tip section. See, I want the whole rod to be working. That's oh. what. That's what's going to give you the the ability to have short uh, casts, accurate casts in close uh, uh, with minimal fly line out, four, five, six, eight, ten feet of fly line, oh, not wow. thirty feet, something like that. So gotcha. that's 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 you know that comes from experience. That's that's how I like it, and, and uh, uh, a lot of my customers uh, absolutely and that we do it that way. I love that. I've, uh, you know, I have an old lamaglass rod. You know, we mentioned lamaglass at the start, and it's, you know, compared to some of these newer rods, like I have another Loomis, older Loomis that's really stiff. This lamaglass is like a noodle, but it's super awesome casting because my dad actually it was my first steelhead rod he ever gave me, and uh, as a kid, and it's just a cool rod because like with heavy sinking lines, it feels really good. It's noodly, but it's an old grad. It was probably from built in the '80s. You know, I don't know, maybe yep. '90s. So talk about the, maybe that rod. I'm sure you don't know exactly what that is, but why would that newly rod feel so cool to me? And then is that similar to what you're talking about here with getting that feel? It is, and it's a concept that's pretty much been kind of bred out of the design, uh, modern design fly rod these days. And and we still incorporate it in a lot of our product, but Lama Glass was, was really known for having a real strong, stout top end and a thick wall of... Uh, thin profile butt section and we can we follow kind of the same similar concept but maybe not quite so strong in the top end of the rod but it's what they had going there is like i said a strong tip you load that thing with the fly line and the butt section is going to bend and if you've got enough carbon fiber in that butt section guess what's going to happen it's going to want to bend but because you got a lot of thick carbon wall there it's not going to want to distort as much as a thin wall will do so as that rod stops and goes back to straight from being oval to straight then you develop your line speed from that energy being released in the walls of that carbon fiber and it's like a storage capacitor in a sense that it that kinetic energy being stored uh in the walls of the material so we design that's we do a lot of designing uh not so much in, with the heavy tips of the old glass or the old carbon fiber stuff. But now we have high modulus materials, intermediate modulus materials, high grade IM6 materials, all sorts of different combinations we can put together to so still get the same response by keeping the rod dramatically lighter in the hand. Uh, now, the thing that I'm reading into this is you're putting this line on. Did you say a sinking line? Yeah, like, yeah, like if you put or, just a standard, yeah, just a standard, like a 10 foot sink tip or something, your cat for like winter steelhead. The last thing you want uh, a rod to do is throw an ultra tight loop with a sinking line because it'll collapse on itself. So if you can imagine that rod developing a real nice, beautiful, deep arc or as you're making the cast, well, the loop is going to follow pretty much the same or the fly line loop is going to pretty much follow the same profile as the bend of the rod. And so it opens up the loop a little bit for you. You're going to feel everything going on. And I remember the old Lama Glass stuff. They had a lot of power in the lower end of those things. You're going to get some distance with it that you wouldn't get if you just had a light tip, fast action. Jeez, it feels like a feather in my hand rod. <laughs> you know? There you go. So there's something, there's definitely something to that. That, that is really cool. And then, and like you said, I mean, it's all. Um, it's kind of, a, I mean, obviously an art, but you know, when you're making your rods, when you're going through this process, how much of it is, is automated? You know, like, uh, I mean, you have your own factory, I guess, or, you know, but 
or are there, you know, in each series, how much like change? Do you just get something set that works? You got a great spay rod that's awesome, people love. Do you just make that exact thing every time, or are you kind of tweaking things as you go? Oh, uh, you know, we've we've tweaked a few things along the way. There's no question about it. Um, as materials keep advancing, red systems keep advancing. Uh, we do a lot of tweaking, but that being said. A lot of the spay patterns that we developed, even starting back in 89 and 90, some of those patterns have never changed. The materials have changed a little bit. Well, quite a bit, actually. The resin systems especially. You know, now we've got all these nano resins and all sorts of fancy work with to really make a light, strong product. But believe it or not, the patterns haven't changed. And uh, so I can, uh, you know, we incorporate all the technology into the same patterns so we don't get away from the core of what we want to, you know, how we want our product to perform. And uh, that's the challenge. It's, you know, you might have the latest and greatest, highest tech stuff, but it's got to be applicable to what you want it to do. Um, and, to, you know, it just can't be, oh, you know, what, what's in the marketing these days? It's just right. all hype. It'd be, oh, look at this generation 25, you know, <laughs> what? Yeah. I don't kind of exaggerating myself. There, yeah, I guess, yeah. But, but like, you know, what's that mean to the fisherman? What, you know, how does that going to add to his enjoyment and pleasure? You know, maybe he can only get out X amount of times a year. And, you, you know, he wants to go out and enjoy and relax and have a good time and not be, you know, and if that, if maybe that's having the latest and greatest. Maybe he can't even cast, but by golly, he's got Generation X, you know, on there. And right. Maybe that's the way he but my customer is going to want to feel the thing they're going to want to enjoy it i i would think and and really have an experience uh that uh um you know that's why they're out on the river they want that experience and, that, and that's what you're painting this picture of yeah when i pick up a trout rod i mean i don't want a, a super stiff rod i mean i want a rod that i could feel all the way through the rod and you know like you're saying casting a short cast that's awesome you know being able to feel that yeah yeah, I'm curious. The, the spay game, obviously, in the, the you know the Northwest and, and around the country, is growing. You know, single spay or you know you got all sorts of this, right? A, a single hand, double hand, all that. Talk yeah. about your transition to spay because I've talked to you know I had George Cook on here, you know, and he talked about the transition to spay. I mean, we've heard about it before, but I'm just curious about you because you transitioned. I think you were building single hand rods before, and then you you transitioned into. I mean, you still do everything, but. Take us to that moment. When, when did that happen and how did that happen? Well, you know, I, uh, yeah, you're right. I was building a lot of single-handed trout rods and a buddy of mine, one of my best friends, uh, we, we both guided together. Uh, we ran a, basically a lodge on the Deschutes River and um, John Hazel came to me and he says, you know, he calls me Berkey and he says, Berkey. Hmm you need to take a look at this two-handed thing. And I'm going, good Lord, John, come on. And I'd been exposed to it back in like 83 or 84. I was with a buddy down in uh, the Moscone Center when the fly fishing shows were going on down in San Francisco. Moved from there to San Mateo. And I was with the buddy, Al Burr, who's well-known in the industry now. as a line designer, rod designer. And Al and I were standing there, and here comes uh, Mike Maxwell from uh, – golden west which and mike had this huge 15 foot two-handed rod and of course he's a brit and kind of scottish sounding brit at that he's, <laughs> he's trying to tell me you got to put this now this and that and the other <laughs> thing you know and he's trying to explain no pawn he's trying to explain to me how a spay cast were gotcha. and i'm looking at this guy keeping this broad around trying to do a double spay with no water load on the line at all and i'm going mike why the hell do you want to do that i mean why don't you just pick it up cast it and he says, oh, you don't understand this and that. And, you know, we, we stood there for a couple hours. The interesting thing is it did plant that curiosity seed in me yep. of how does this work? Well, so this is like 83, 84. Well, in okay. about 88, uh, I had I'd quit the uh, rod company uh, up in Woodland and went to guide uh, with uh, Hazel on the Deschutes River and teach fly fishing schools. So in about 1988, uh I'm sitting there in my shop up the Washougal River, and John comes in and he says, "You got to look at this two-handed thing. I think it's going to go somewhere." And I'm going, "Oh, dude, come on! You realize how much material this takes? Hmm. You realize the cost?" And at the time, I was I had a, a key to the uh, the woodland shop, so I could go in there and do all my R and D and stuff off hours. They, uh, I did that for basically helping them maintain their 
uh, designs and stuff like that for their their up and coming series of fly rods. So I finally succumbed to it, and I said, "I'll try to go ahead and roll a two handed rod." It was a three piece, and I had no idea where to go with this thing. I took a look at what we had, and first thing I did is I made the thing too stiff in the lower end because it was a real fast rod, probably a good overhead casting rod, as I remember, but not a good spay casting rod. And, and of course, none of us really understood spay casting 100% because uh, it was such an infancy. We didn't even have spay lines. We are using double taper 10 weights and 9 weights that Hardy had made, 120-foot salmon lines. Mm. Uh, so we're trying to figure this out. And finally, John says, look, I'm going to the Dean River. I'm taking some guys with me. Let's see if we could get at least one or two spay rods that work uh, so I could take them on the Dean. And so I worked on it, worked on it. We went out and cast, came back, worked some more, thinned this out, added material here and there. And lo and behold, one morning we actually had the thing dialed. And um, so I made another one. And then I, of course, then I had the daunting task of how, how do I build this thing into a rod? And so I shaped, you know, got a real seat, put it on, and we figured out about the length of the butt grip and the foregrip. And I, I took me three and a half to four hours to shape just the handle because I didn't know what I was doing. I, I mean, so I decided on a, a full wells grip was kind of classic looking. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I was finally got this thing shaped, and I bet you the epoxy was barely dry when Hazel comes, picks it up, and takes it to the dean. And when he got back, I had orders for two or three rods just from that one trip. Everybody loved that rod so much. It was a 15-foot 10 weight, which is now a – that's a big stick now. You know, we're all talking sevens and eights and, you know, even sixes and fives. But uh, And that's really what got me into the spade game. I did a bunch of uh, stuff for guys going to the Dean. My name got out because a lot of these guys travel. And they, it's a small network or fraternity of guys that fish steelhead fish. And uh, all of a sudden, I was getting calls from all over the place to make these 15-foot tens. And I thought, you know, let's do a nine-way. So I I uh, studied my tapers and all, all that, and I had a 14-foot, 5-inch nine-way that I came out with. That was a huge hit. And then we did the 8133, uh, which is the third design that I did. And that was a th- all these were three piece rods, uh, fallen on the same kind of profile, same materials, same everything. And that was it. That one really put us on the map. It was the eighty one thirty three, the ninety one forty five, and then we did a seven weight, which was unheard of back then, seventy one thirty. So we were actually kind of leading the way, and all this came from just the passion of wanting to steelhead fish with the two handed rod. You know, that's no one was asking me for thirteen foot seven weight. It's just, I thought it just that it sounded cool, <laughs> so that's what we did. Wow, that was very yeah. cool. So basically, you were kind of testing. Uh, so on that rod, when you found that first rod, that that fifteen foot ten weight that felt, yeah. you know, you were like, "Oh, this is it." Like, what were how many steps along the way was it? Like, you you made a rod, get you know Hazel out there, whoever tests these rods out, come back, or or you were out. I mean, yeah. how did that work? How how many how many repetitions of that did it take you? How long before you got it? You're like, "This is it." You know, I'm I'm gonna guess. We probably worked on it for about six months. Um, you know, not not a whole really. When you think about it, not a great deal of time. Uh, and we did some a little bit of tweaking along the way as far as the tips. I wanted a really strong tip on a spay rod. You don't want a light tip. Uh, like the same concept, you want that tip to load the rest of the rod, and that's what's making that cast is the rest of the rod. And um, I'm going to guess that overall, we probably worked on it for about nine months to a year overall. But um, the first one, really, the first one was probably about three to six months, I'm going to guess, where we started. We actually had something tangible that we could work with. Perfect, perfect. And and so that was, yeah, that was back in the day when you, the big rods, and now a lot of them are going shorter and shorter. What now is the rod, you know, when somebody comes to you, what, what's the most common ask you're hearing from the, on the spay, the two-handed spay? Yeah, you know, we, we offer so many different models, but I think the most common one right now is still the seven weight or the eight weight. Depends on where they're going. If they're going to BB or something, they're looking at 7134, 8134, 8142. That's like an eight, uh, eight weight, 14 foot, two inch. We put the line weight at the very beginning of it. Now the trout spade thing has started up. So we're doing uh, 12 foot, five inch, five weights, uh, 11 foot, four inch, four weights. 
all sorts of configurations of different rods uh, that are really becoming extremely popular in our shop. It's it's really been something else for us to, you know, and, and it's what's interesting is it, it's been really pleasant because I haven't, I got my own shop. I mean, I rolled the blanks and everything. Six, well, now seven, we just hired another guy. We got seven guys working there and it's, it's quite a force to be reckoned with when we're trying to get stuff going here and getting stuff out the door and keeping the quality high, which is absolutely mandatory. You can't be, you know, cutting corners on anything. But um, but I'm going to guess, really, depending on where the guy is going, and my clients are going everywhere from Russia to Iceland to Norway to B.C., it's usually going to be the seven and the eight weights that are going to be the bulk of it. Yeah, 13 uh, foot, 13, four. Yeah, you get in Norway. We're talking to guys. We're doing an eighteen foot rod for a guy right now. It's a it's a ten weight, and then we're doing the sixteen foot uh, nine weights uh, that are going to be very popular in that the Norwegian rivers and Swedish rivers. Yeah, because they're doing the full the long belly stuff, the bigger lines. Right. Yeah. Why do you think um, you know the thirteen foot, uh, you know thirteen four, thirteen three? Why has that become the sweet spot? Why not a 13, uh, 8, 14, you know, or it seems like that 13 is a good all around, you know, if you want a rod that's just, that can do it all. Why do you think that is for, on your rods? You know, I think that they're, number one, they're easy to cast. And I think that even a, a budding beginner, you know, he's, he's putting some money on the table here. You have a time done with the reel, a line and a rod, and we won't even talk about the waders and stuff. You're into it pretty close. <laughs> Well, you could be into it for three thirty five hundred bucks pretty quick, and uh, really quick. And so, I think it's the the convenience of the, the you know four piece breaks down well. And we also do some five piece for guys that really travel a lot. But the convenience of the breakdown, the, then thirteen and a half foot in that ballpark seems like it's it's a big rod, but it's not as big as fifteen, and it's certainly not as short as eleven and a half, and so I think the guys like the length of it for that for that purpose. I'm thinking that, um, you know, of course the guy, you know, we have a lot of dealers too. And I think that the dealer knows his customer well. And uh, he knows if he sells them the 7134 or an 8134, that customer is going to come back happy. It's an easy rod to use. It's been tried and true out on the water. You know, there's minimal, minimal uh, breakage history on the thing. Uh, and most of that's angler air, but uh, anyway, that's what I think. Age. And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. With more than forty years of experience in coffee, the Anglers Coffee Team roasts a full range of coffees with one goal in mind: delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. Responsibly sourced from farms using sustainable growing practices, you can rest easy knowing you are doing your part. Roasted and shipped within 48 hours to assure freshness. For me, it's all about that freshness and taste. When I crack open a bag of Anglers in the morning, I feel good because I know it not only tastes amazing, but I'm supporting great movements along the way. With a coffee blend for every taste, a dry dropper on the go tea bag option, and a roast sampler, you know Joe at Anglers is serving your needs. It's time to step up to better coffee and more impact for the fish species and causes that we love. Just visit wetflyswing.com slash anglers to grab your bag of greatness today. That's wetflyswing.com slash anglers, A-N-G-L-E-R-S, to make a change and get a sweet taste today. Okay, now back to the show. Yeah, and just to describe, we talked about this, uh, George Cook mentioned this, I think the 7134, just that numbering, how you say it, I think... He noted that Sage maybe was the first company that started doing that. It's kind of interesting, you know, people that know, obviously, you know what it is. But describe that again. So 71, so what the numbering is 71, uh, well, your most popular, you mentioned, was the 8133? Yeah, the 7134, 8134. So a 13-foot, 4-inch, 7-weight, or a 13-foot, 4-inch, 8-weight are very, very popular. We're always selling those things. Yeah, that's it. Nice. So, so that gives us a, a little perspective on how, you know, the spay thing came to you and now you're still building, you know, you got a little bit of everything out there, including the trout stuff. Um, I mean, w what keeps you going now? I mean, you've done this, you've had this passion for so long, you know, it sounds like, um, 
you know, when you get up in the morning, do you still have that fire to come into the shop? And, and what keeps you going now? Because it seems like you, you got some good stuff. You're kind of at the pinnacle. Um, anything new for you? Anything new coming up or to get, get you fired up? Yeah, I mean, when I first met Russ Peak, um, I'm going to answer this in a roundabout way. <laughs> yeah, don't go for it. Uh, when I first met Russ Peak, I think he was probably in his mid to late 70s. And I went down, I flew down to Pasadena. I spent several days with him in his shop. And I did this three or four or five times a year. And I'll never forget the first time I walk up to his little shop in Allen Boulevard there in Pasadena. And the door's locked. I'm basically wiping the dust off the, the glass door and looking in. And there's this, there's this guy honkered over a, a lathe with the files and he's turning the handle. And uh, I get his attention. He, he comes to the door and he lets me in and we talk. And he goes back to grinding this handle so I could watch. And then he stops the lathe after he's done with the handle and he says, you sure you want to be doing this? <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it really, I, it really puts some element of reality into the whole perspective. Here's this guy, almost 80, and he's in here working by himself, uh, shaping the grip for a customer. He really had to have loved what he was doing. And uh, right then and there, I, just, I had to make a choice. I mean, I asked myself, I'm not sure if this is what I really want to <laughs> be doing at 70 years old. And part of the thing is, is Russ decided to pretty much keep it. Uh, just a one to two man shop. He did have some apprentices working for him that didn't last long. I decided to have a larger company uh, where we can do, you know, and even our company small in the, in the, you know, we're nothing compared to some big businesses out there, big, big rod companies out there. But we crank out about 1200 to 1800 rods a year. We're trying to get to the, about 22 to 2500 mark. Um, but without suffering the quality. But, you know, for me, it was just like, how is this really what I want to do? Okay, so now, to answer your question, the thing that keeps me going in this is not going in there and grinding handles every day, I'll be honest. <laughs> I have an employee that, and two that do that. <laughs> but the thing that keeps, keeps my interest for this many years is I love the design part of it. I absolutely love it. And I told the guy one time, he says, how many nine foot five weight patterns do you have? And this is, this is 10 years ago or maybe 15 years ago. I said, I probably have 60 and he just about oh, dropped wow. them. Yep. And I said, they all have changed. There's renditions of different materials, different resin systems, different reinforcement materials, different experiments that I've tried to really uh, hone in on what I think is the best combination. And that, that is no exaggeration. I, ha I, I mean, it's un really when you look at the catalog of, of the designs that we have, it's it's pretty amazing of what we can do. No, but cool. yeah, so here within the last three or four, well, really about four or five years now, materials have taken another advancement, and and uh, and it's not all real high stiff stuff. It's more it's stronger materials with the nano resins. It's stronger reinforcement of fibers that keep that blank together better. And it's allowed me to do things that I could not have done 15, 20 years ago. I had the, I had the dream list. Hey, can, you know, I talked to the graphite suppliers. And then I worked for the company up at Woodland. They, they came and took me out to lunch. They, I was, um, was going to make the decisions on what materials they were going to sell uh, to us. But so now we're not that big of a business, but, but I still have access to some of the finest quality materials. And it really, it really gets me excited. Uh, I can lay there in bed and design stuff in my head about how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? Where do I put this? Then get to the shop, draw it up. And in some cases, by two o'clock in the afternoon, I got a prototype in my hand of what I thought about. That Amazing. Morning. That's cool. To me, that's cool. That is really cool. Yeah, that's that's what separates, you know. Yeah, just think about the process of all the different types of, you know, companies that are doing this, right? You got, you got the... The, the blanks coming from overseas and, and you got all sorts of different levels, but literally you're sitting there, you could from concept, you know, from the middle of the night to rotted hand the next day. I mean, that is killer. Yeah. It really is fun uh, for me. Yeah. So. 
What do you ask when somebody comes into, you know, the shop uh, or, you know, connects with you on the phone and they say, I want a new custom rod or, or whatever, I just want a new rod. Is there a, what does that look like for you? I mean, how custom, I, I mean, I know they can just buy something off the shelf, but how often are you doing something where they need a specific, you know, for that person? Is that, is that something as far as the handle that you're doing all the time or is that just kind of one-off stuff? You know, the, the, the company started basically as a custom design company. If you called me up and said, Kerry, I'm going to go fish the Big Hole River or the Big Horn or wherever, I'm going to be fishing primarily uh, streamers, and uh, but I want to be able to do some nymph and then some big terrestrial drives or something like that, I'd actually design a, a nine foot five or six weight for you that was going to do that really well. And um, so I, it started out very specific. Well, that's not very practical when you're trying to sell, you know, no. 12 or 1500 rods a year you can't design each one of them like that you go crazy uh so uh i boiled and condensed down basically the patterns into some of the, the what was what really turned out to be the best out of all these different designs what was the best and the most applicable for the customer so when a guy comes in we, well i'm doing four rods for a guy right now nine foot four weights they're custom designed uh, I wouldn't sell that to just anybody. He has a specific reason for it. He wanted me to do it. So I, I went ahead and held the handles are like 11, 12, 11 inches long. And it's not oh, a wow. two handed, it's a single handed rod. That's <laughs> what he has a specific. I think he's fishing chronomid. This is how he wants these rods to be. So that's, that's what we did. And he's an old customer. I wouldn't do it just for anybody, but he's an old customer. But now uh, our designs are, are, very well accepted right now. So the guy can come in and say, hey, can you make the grip a little longer? Can you make the grip a little thinner, a little fatter? How about those agate guides for the strippers? And uh, what what can you do for woods? Oh, geez, I want this California Buckeye or I want this Coca-Cola. Right. You know, we can really put the thing together. We we work with, uh, you know, four different pigments of, of paint to make the, the green, blue, black, or clear blank. Uh, so there's a lot of custom options we offer today. This is not, and it's a special order. It's going to take some, but you can definitely, hopefully, get what you want as far as the color. Now I'm, I'm not going to make no pink rods or nothing like that. You know, that's, not, <laughs> that's not your style. It's just not, you know. And and, and I found out that the women don't want them pink anyway. No. They would rather just have just exactly. a nice classy rod, minimal bling, but a little bling is nice. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. That's that's awesome. We had um, Tom Williams, one of the listeners uh, on this podcast. Uh, hopefully, he's listened to this now. He had a question for you. Um, I think you said that the soul of the rod, or you have this kind of—I don't know if it's your slogan—but the soul of the rod. He was curious. What maybe we've talked about that today, but what does that mean to you when you say the soul of the rod? Have we have we already covered that today, or is that something you can uh, enlighten us on? Yeah, the soul of the rod is going to be the feel, you know, and I. We actually use terms like the rod is the rod talking to you. I mean, it sounds weird, but it's true. Uh, you know, people associate it with an extension of themselves on the water. You think the cast, the rod casts. I mean, that's really kind of that that way of it's almost like having a hunting dog. A good hunting dog is going to keep in touch with you and look at you. Well, the rod can kind of be that way too. I mean, it's not going to look at you, but the feel of it. Hey, I want to stretch this out a little further. I want to open the loop a little bit more want to tighten it up and get underneath that tree you know you, you should be able to do all that and it, that takes technique but a good rod should be able to do you know have that happen for you for sure yeah that's it all right and uh you know we're going to start to wrap this up uh carrie pretty quick here but i was just curious another episode we did a while back was um with tom morgan um you know rod smiths and i know i never met tom but we heard some stories I think you do some, uh, the blanks, to, is that something you do for them or companies around where they're actually, obviously not everybody has their own shop making their own blanks. Is that something you're doing more of these days? Yeah, you know, we're, we really try to only do a little bit of outside or, or contract work for very, very few people. We do sell to some custom rod builders. Uh, we do business with uh, Morgan Rodsmith. Tom was a very, very dear friend of mine. And uh, that's a whole nother podcast. He's a, he was a wonderful man. Uh, but he, um, we did a lot of, we've done a lot of contract work in, for them in particular. But really, we're so busy, it's hard to be able to allocate X amount of hours and in, in time into other, uh, you know, without, it takes away from our own productivity is what it does. 
Gotcha. So you just can't. It's just limited. Like you said, if you're going to produce uh, 2,500 rods, you can't you know, produce another 2,500 blanks to send out to people. And I think part of that too, Dave, is that we don't want to be a big company. I mean, that, that's, that, that probably blows some people away. I want to be the best company. I've been in the boardrooms of the big companies before. I don't want to do that anymore. You know, it, it's, it's not very purple. Uh, it doesn't allow the artist to really express what he wants to do. I mean, yeah. you're, you're now you're being guided by lines instead of, it's just not right to put this out on the market, even though we spent time on it. We can't let, release it. All those decisions are happening all the time in our shop. Uh, and uh, we don't have to. We don't have to deal with that kind of that type of stress or pressure. And you know, we got pressure and stress. Trust me, but in a different way. In a different way. So. Yeah, you're still fully in control. Yeah, you don't have a necessarily a board that you know you have to do this. You, that's the cool thing is you've got your own. You've got full control. I mean, it's pretty much just you. I mean, you're a. You've got some people on staff, but it's uh, at the end of the day, it stops with you, right? You're making the decisions on design and what you're going to do next, the next project. Oh, sure. And, you know, and you're, you're correct. I'll make the final decision, but I, I really do lean on my staff. I want to know, how can we do this better? You know, how can we, how can we save time on this yet not cut corners at all and make a better product overall for the customer and try to get these things out instead of, you know, four months, maybe we can cut it down to a month and a half or two months instead of, you know, it depends on how many rods we have on order. We, this last year was just phenomenal. Uh, I, I've never seen anything like it before. It just, we, there was no, we were, we're still filling orders from like September, August. No kidding. I mean, it just, crazy. yeah, wow. it's just crazy how it's, the demand was just super, super high. That's amazing. So if somebody's listening now and they're, they're kind of excited about this, what we're talking about here, where would you send them if they want to pick up a rod? Is it something where, you know, they should call your shop or you do you direct them to other fly shops? What do you tell somebody? Say they're just in the Northeast right now or some part of the country and then they're really interested. What, where do you take them? You know, uh, we have dealers, but we, we don't have a really large dealer network right now. And we're kind of slowly kind of carving on that. Uh, and the, is what's really driving that is we can't produce a whole lot anyway. So it's kind All right. Of, crazy to try to open up all these shops if you can't deliver product so we're really take, taking that in stride and really trying to balance that equation out right now still but i i send people to shops all the time uh you know a good shop is going to have some rods on stock you know and, and you can go to our website at uh, www.cfbflyrods.com and there's a dealer listing there and um, we've re- no, we frequently direct people to the hey call up this shop or that shop or whatever and if they have it call us back up and we'll put you on the books you know and try to get you something uh as soon as we possibly can perfect yeah so if somebody like michael right now is listening uh you know if, uh, he's out on, on long island if he wanted to pick up one of your rods he could um basically just go to your website find somebody who's close or even just connect with you and maybe send a, a message to find out where he can find one or maybe it might take a little while are these most of these things can you pick up um or is some of the stuff like you said you're kind of waiting on back order yeah it's part of our well our whole business is custom orders so we only build to, to the order. We don't stock a bunch of stuff. And every yeah, every once in a while, we got a trot rod or two or a steelhead rod, um, you know, that we've um, maybe used in a sports show or maybe just just built. And uh, we've had some guys that, uh, especially during the pandemic, they got they couldn't travel, so they didn't need a rod. And so we had a couple of rods sitting around. That that kind of stuff is on occasion, but very rarely do we have something around just to call up the shop and order. Or, you know, have it where we could just put it in the UPS that day and have it to you. Right. But, uh, yeah. But the um, Streams of Dreams on the East Coast is one of the shops that we have over there. And I think that's I, – I, yeah, then we have Hodson's down, I think, South Carolina. Uh, but there's there's some shops around that have them. But really, from – really, we're more well-known in the West. We really are. Uh, you know, Montana, I. Washington, Oregon, Northern California, we're very well known. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I'm curious, as uh, you know, you mentioned the musician. I'm just curious on what you, uh, what instrument that was. What, what were you into back in the day when you thought maybe you were going to be pro in that? <laughs> yeah. By the way, I'm glad I was not a musician. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's a whole other. 
too. <laughs> right, right. Too much is that. That's too much. Uh, like the party life probably would have killed you, right? Oh well, when you take a look at how some of my buddies turned out, I'm, I'm well. Some of them aren't here with us right now. Let's put it that way. Right. But um, I played. Uh, I, I really fancied myself as being a guitar player, and I still have. I have still do it i still play and practice a little bit here and there it's uh, i really enjoy it now when i was trying to be successful at it i didn't enjoy it very much the the pressure was just incredible uh it's a really a compromising business to be in i I knew some people in it and boy it's it's hardcore um cutthroat type of stuff but i played uh played guitar bass some drums piano wow uh really actually i actually used to be able to sing i don't think i'd want to try it anymore now <laughs> but uh, that's that's something you got to practice every day to get those vocal cords tuned in you know that's right but, uh, but I, I i studied the music in college that's what i did i was a okay. music major in college. yeah there you I go practiced 68, 68 hours a day wow 68 hours. Uh, piano bass drums vocals all that stuff guitar yeah that is crazy okay so so that's kind of the music, and I'm curious. And you mentioned Tom Morgan. I would definitely love to dig more into Tom at a at a later point. Um, he's obviously a pretty influential person, you know, in fly fishing and rod building. But um, uh, Lefty Cray also, obviously, we we had one episode. You know, Lefty was a big. I'm curious. Do you have a Lefty story or something? When I say Lefty Cray, what what comes? I mean, obviously, this guy was bigger than life, and he's you know, and all that. But um, you know, take us out of here with with a lefty. Like, what what do you think of when you hear a lefty and the story? Do you have something for us? You know, something. Well, the guy was just full of jokes, and I wish I could remember some of them. Some of them I couldn't probably beat on the air. No, <laughs> yeah, not not PC, right? He did have some pretty risque jokes. He really did. Yeah, lefty was a he just met you where you're at. Here's this famous guy, probably one of the most famous personalities in the world, and I mean. As long as you didn't insult the guy, or, or I don't even know how you'd piss him off, to be honest, you were on the same level as he was. And and I think that's what really uh, struck me so much of what a genuinely nice, kind man this guy was. Uh, always full of information, willing to share and give uh, uh, without any kind of, you know, conditions. It, it was just free giving. And what a wonderful, wonderful person. And uh, I, I've really, uh, I think I contacted him a year or two before he passed away and, and I knew his wife was having some trouble. I think she just had passed away and I think lefty, I said, dude, I, I mean, thank you so much for encouraging me and, and, uh, sticking with me, you know, and I could call him up at his home at almost any hour. And he, you know, we would talk a little bit here and there. Just what a wonderful, wonderful mentor and friend that he was to me still, so, yeah, that's it. That's it. I mean, you can't ask for much more, right? You think about your life and what you do and, and you're, you know, I'm sure you're at the same way, right? This level of quality and I'm sure you've influenced lots of people, um, you know, that are saying the same thing about you, right? Thanking you for sharing that insight into what it takes to build a, uh, a cool uh, rod. Um, all right, Kerry. Well, I definitely feel like this is one we could we could keep going for a, quite a while here, but I'll uh, definitely respect your time. Uh, just give us a heads up in the next uh, year or so. Anything new? Kind of a shout out to anything you got coming up here? You want to highlight for us? Yeah, no, 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 that sounds great, Dave. I really appreciate the opportunity too. Thank you, and uh, hope this adds something to your you know listenership or whatever. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, this this will. <laughs> we're always trying to grow the show. This will be. Uh, we have a huge chunk of steelhead fishermen. Uh, and obviously Northwest is big, so this will be definitely lots of people. And I just hope I, I did it justice today. Does it does it feel like we uh, we covered things? We maybe got a few uh, new nuggets out of this one for the people. Yeah, I think so. You know, it's a, it's for me. It's a story that uh, I should probably sit down and write write it out because I mean to talk this out would be crazy. <laughs> just it would, it, we'd have to be having a couple of whiskeys to go with this or something. Exactly. That's it. Well, I'll, I'll put a link out to April's. I know April uh, had a on Anchored had a good show with you, so you dug into some more of the history, so people can listen to that, and that's that's awesome. But cool, Carrie. Well, I'll let you get out of here. Thanks again for all the time and everything you do. I appreciate it, and I will keep in touch with you as we go. Thank you very much, Dave, and take care. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links, and everything else we cover today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 282. 282 will get you there. 
If you are new to the show, uh, please take a moment and click that subscribe button before we get out of here. Uh, you can do that on whatever app you're in. Or if you're on an Apple podcast, it's that little plus sign in the upper right corner, uh, at least at the time of this recording. That's where it is. Click that plus sign and follow this podcast and you'll get updated when the next episode drops in your inbox. Okay. I'm going to let you get off and get to the next episode, whatever you have on tap, on cue. I'd be interested to hear what you have uh, on cue. Are you going to listen to uh, another episode in the uh, fishing uh, space, another episode here, or you got something else? Uh, Send me a a message on social media. Uh, You can find us at Wet Fly Swing and uh, and just leave a little lightning bolt emoji. And, and let me know what other podcast is your favorite uh, other than this one. What else you got out there? Give me a shout out and I uh, would love to check out a new podcast episode myself. I'm always interested in hearing, uh, you know, I know there's something I'm missing. So give a shout out and looking forward to catching up with you on the river or online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.